that song is probably familiar to some of us. It's called You Lost That Love and Feeling by the Righteous Brothers. Great song. You've probably never heard it played in church before, though. And it's here today because it's part of a special series that we're doing called Love Songs. We're talking about marriage, sex, and relationships. And, and what we found is that our culture has an understanding of these topics, and it's easiest to see that when we look at the songs we sing about them, our love songs. You know, this song in particular is, is kind of a, it's an awesome song, like we said, but it's kind of a sad song. It's a song about this love that was strong at one point, but it's fallen apart, the flame has gone out, and at least the guy wants to get back together. It's a situation that too many people find themselves in. There are a lot of marriages in our culture, in our communities that have suffered, that have fallen apart, that have lost that love and feeling. And maybe you're one of those today. Maybe you're feeling what this song sings about. And if that's the case, you've chosen a great day to join us because we're going to be looking at a biblical love song, the Song of Songs, talking about some really practical insights that God gives us for protecting our marriages and keeping that love and feeling alive. If you've got your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you, turn to the book of Song of Songs. It's in the Old Testament. We're going to be in chapter 7. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can always download the YouVersion Bible app. It's the Y-O-U version. It's free. Or you can follow along on the screen behind. In any event, we're going to be in Song of Songs chapter 7. And if you've been with us at all throughout this series so far, you've probably picked up that the two characters in this song have a really special kind of love. They've got the kind of marriage that we all hope and wish our marriages to be. Just listen to how this husband talks about his wife a little bit. This is in chapter 6, a little bit before our passage. He says, Sixty queens there may be, and eighty concubines, and virgins beyond number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. The only daughter of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The young women saw her and called her blessed. The queens and concubines praised her. Essentially what he's saying is, there are oodles of very attractive and desirable women out there, but my girl is special. And in fact, she is admired and she is envied by all these other women because she is one of a kind. This is a guy that loves his wife. And he's saying this stuff, not like during the honeymoon phase where you look at life through rose-tinted glasses and nobody ever farts and there's nothing wrong with each other. You know what I'm talking about? This is real life. This is when stuff is sat in, the bills are coming due, the kids are yelling at each other, you're angry, you're frustrated, and yet in that stage of life, he still says, my baby is one of a kind, I wouldn't trade her for anybody, she's better than any of these other girls. Now that's a pretty impressive kind of love, right? Who doesn't want to have that relationship? And when we look at what makes this relationship strong, and we look at this entire song, which is what we ought to do this morning, but we just don't have time, we see a couple of patterns start to emerge. There are certain things that they're doing that keep that love and feeling alive. For example, first thing that we see, if we want to keep our, our marriage strong, if we want to keep that love and feeling alive, we've got to talk about our love for one another. We've got to vocalize this stuff. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. This is the husband singing again. Listen to what he says. He goes on to say, How beautiful your sandaled feet, O prince's daughter. Your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of an artist's hands. Your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools of Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Your nose is like the tower of Lebanon looking toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, my love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of a palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. That's what he says to her. Here's the beginning of her response. She says, may the wine go straight to my beloved, flowing gently over lips and teeth. So here's the deal with this guy. He's looking at his wife, and he is finding something about her every feature to compliment. He starts at her feet, and he works his way up all the way to the top of her head. And he says, I, your kisses are like wine. And, and she responds, she says, if they're like wine, then drink up and let it go to your head. These are two people that are in love. And here's what I think is special about this little interaction. He's saying all of these things, and she responds. 
which means these are not things he's just thinking. These are not things he's saying to himself. These are not things he's saying to the wind. He is saying these things to her. He's telling her how much he appreciates her. He's telling her how much he desires her. He is vocalizing all the things that he is feeling and all the things that he adores about her. And that may seem like a small detail, but in our relationships and in our busy lives, sometimes it's that small detail that often goes overlooked. And we can just assume that our our, our spouse knows how we feel. Or we can just assume our spouse knows how much we appreciate them or what we appreciate about them. When in reality, you don't gain the ability to read minds just because you said, I do. Anybody guilty of that? Or can anybody do that? You read your mind, you know exactly what your spouse is thinking. No, we need to hear the words. We need somebody to say these things. That's such an important thing that we have to keep in mind. We have to talk about our love. And when we look at these words in particular of the man, we get to see what he's doing here. We see that his words break down into two different categories. The first is what he appreciates about her. He compliments her. He talks about her features, her figure, her her lovely, beautiful face, and so on. He compliments her. Second thing that he does is he's not shy about telling her how she makes him feel. We're just going to paraphrase. It's, ooh, baby, ooh, baby, I want you. She fills him with desire, and he tells her. So we've got compliments, what he admires, and desires, how she makes him feel. We'll talk about compliments first. Who here hates receiving compliments? Not a single hand. One person. Okay. Okay. Other than that, nobody dislikes a compliment. In fact, we probably like compliments. When was the last time somebody said, you know, you look good in that shirt, and you said, who do you think you are telling me what I look good in? I don't need your opinion. I know what I look good in. Thank you very much. Yet nobody, we don't do that. We say thank you. We might even be a little flattered because with maybe the exception of one person, we almost universally understand compliments to be a good thing. And there's actually a little bit of science to this. There was a a neurological study done at the University of Zurich. What they found was that the parts of the brain that light up when we receive a compliment are the same parts of the brain that light up during sex. Just put that in perspective for a minute, okay? Your words are powerful things. Words matter. And when we talk about complimenting our spouse, we probably ought to clarify too. In the song, he compliments her appearance, but it's really more than this, okay? It's, it's simply saying to your spouse, this is what I appreciate about you. If it's their appearance, compliment that. That never hurt. Everybody likes being told they're attractive. But maybe it's a a skill they have. Maybe it's it's part of their character that you admire. Maybe it's just something that they, I I don't know, they're really good at doing. My wife, she's a great cook, and she loves being complimented on her cooking. The problem is I'm not a super expressive person. All of this business, that's for your benefit to make this point. That's not me in real life. If you were to sit down for dinner with me and have a one-on-one conversation, I'm boring. I'm dull as dirt, okay? I'm very subdued. And so I have to put in this extra effort to make sure she understands how much I appreciate her cooking. Because I might say something like, oh, this is good. And to me, that's a lot, okay? That means, wow, this is one of the best things I've eaten. So I have to go a little further and say, baby, this is good. I don't want to stop eating this. I'm going to get another plate. And she understands then that, wow, this, this is really good. He's really complimenting this thing that I'm very proud of. And her whole face lights up. When we compliment, when we talk about what we appreciate in our spouse, it's not just the physical, it's the emotional, it's the skill, it's the connection we have with them. We've got to talk about that. And the same thing goes with desire. You may have noticed he's not shy about telling her how she, make, how she makes him feel. Yeah, that's the right way to say that. He says, you fill me with desire. And we've got to vocalize how our spouse makes us feel. Maybe they make you feel sexy. Tell them. Or maybe they make you feel safe. Or maybe they make you feel secure with yourself. Or maybe they make you feel valuable and important. Or maybe they make you feel full of joy. Whatever feeling your spouse gives you and makes you feel, tell them. They need to know this stuff. And we can't really expect them to know how they make us feel or how much we appreciate them unless we use our words and tell them. And here's an extra thought to chew on. Because words are so easy if we're not the ones making our spouse feel appreciated, someone else may very well be. 
Now, fellas, I don't know about you, but I got a bit of a jealous streak when it comes to my wife. And I don't want some other guy making her feel more appreciated than I do. And ladies, I imagine it's probably the same for you. You probably don't want your man feeling more appreciated by some other lady than by you. So there's a real simple way to guard our marriages and protect that. And that's simply to tell them what you appreciate and how they make you feel. we got to talk about our love. That's one observation that we see in this song, something they're doing pretty frequently. Another thing that they're doing, they're making time for their love. And if we want to keep that love and feeling alive, we have to make time for our love. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 10. This is the woman's response still. She says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded, if their blossoms have opened, and if the pomegranates are in bloom. And there I will give you my love. So she basically says to her husband, let's get out of town. Let's go on a getaway. Let's just go out to the country. Let's take a stroll through the vineyards. And then I'll give you my love. She has a plan for this trip, right? She wants this to be a romantic getaway. But here's the key point that I want us to zero in on. It is a getaway. They are making time to be together. They're making time for one another to connect in that way. Now, I'm not telling you anything we don't already know, but life gets really busy, right? And making time is not always a simple task because we've got a job that we work at 8 to 12 hours a day, depending on what your shift is. And then we come home, and we've got meals to fix, and we've got laundry to do, and we've got yards to mow. And if you've got kids, there's more responsibilities on top of that. And by the time you finally sit down for the first time since the sun came up, it's almost ready for bed, right? You're tired, Life is busy, and it's never going to stop being busy. And that's why we have to take it upon ourselves to make some time. It's easy to lose sight of just how much time we're giving our spouse and our love. There was a study done in Britain, and I imagine the American counterpart is pretty similar. There was a study done in Britain that found that the average couple has about 150 minutes together total every day. Again, that's not 150 minutes of quality time. That's total time. 30 minutes of that is used for eating meals. About 24 minutes is used for doing chores around the house. 55 minutes, about a third of the time, is used for watching television. There may be some skewed priorities here. And that leaves just 16 minutes for meaningful conversation and connection with your spouse. Now, let me ask you, do you think your relationship can thrive on 16 minutes a day? That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? It sounds like it's more likely that our marriage is going to run out of gas. It kind of reminds me of this junker car that I used to drive. It was this old Pontiac. It had a hundred things wrong with it. I shouldn't have been driving it, but it was paid for, so there you go. The most frustrating thing about this car was the fuel gauge because it was stuck on full. You'd be driving around, always thinking you had a full tank of gas. And you knew in the back of your mind, I don't have a full tank, but there's just this subconscious thing. You look down, it's full. I'm fine. There's no problem here. But it had an alarm that would go off whenever you had less than, a six, or less than an eighth a tank of gas. So you'd be driving along, and it would go, bing, and go back over to full. And that little alarm was your indication that you needed to get to a gas station pronto, or you were going to be stuck on the side of the road. It was a miserable way to travel, really. And sometimes we treat our lives like that car. We pack our lives so full of stuff, and we go, and we go, and we go, and we go, and we think everything is fine. We think there's a full tank of gas in the car. Realistically, we know there's probably not, but we're just assuming everything is fine until the alarm goes off, bing, to tell us that we are so close to disaster. And in our marriages, that alarm oftentimes sounds like this. I'm not happy anymore. Bing. I'm not real sure that this is what I want anymore. Bing. I feel like we've drifted apart. Here's the only good news about a drift. It doesn't happen instantaneously. You've never heard somebody tell you the story. We were sitting around the kitchen table, having dinner, 
One minute, everything was fine. The next minute, we drifted apart. I don't know what happened. You've never heard that because drifts are not instantaneous. They are slow and progressive. And that's the only good news because that means that if we can just wake up, we might be able to catch a drift before it's too late. But that means making the time to be with one another, making the time to have the conversation, are we doing okay? And if not, how do we fix it? we got to start putting first things first in our lives. Number one priority, number one time slot in our agenda is this incredible God who loves us, who's filled our life with meaning and joy and gives clarity to the rest of the universe. He is the organizing principle of life. And if he's not in the number one spot, nothing else is going to line up or make any sense. He's got to be the number one priority. Just a little below him, though, this number two priority in our schedules. It's not our career, and it's not our hobbies, and it's not the game that's on TV. It's not even our kids and their endless parade of activities. Your kids might be a little disappointed if they don't play every sport known to man, but ultimately they're going to be fine. But if your marriage falls apart midway through high school, I can tell you your kids are not going to be fine. They're going to have a lot of stuff to work through. So for their sake, for your sake, put the right thing in the number two spot. We've got to make time for each other, for our spouse, for this incredible person that this incredible God has blessed us with and put in our lives to have and to hold, to love and to cherish in sickness and death, or sickness and life, you better or worse. You know how it goes. I need the book in order to get the vows right. But you know what I'm saying here. We got to put that person at that number two spot. We got to make the time. We got to put first things first. If we care about our marriages, if we want to keep that love and feeling, we got to make time for our love. And making time in this, this chapter, it meant for them a weekend getaway. It might not mean a weekend getaway for you. It might mean simply going on a date once in a while or, or sitting down to a quiet dinner, just the two of you, or even staying home and watching your favorite movie together. Whatever it might be, make sure it is intentional time where you connect with your spouse and you make time to make sure everything's okay. Keep that love and feeling alive by making time. So there's two observations. There's a third one in here as well, and this one, frankly, is way more fun. This is the most fun, I think. We keep reading, and what we find is that if we want to keep that love and feeling alive, we've got to make time to consummate that love. You knew it was coming, right? This whole series is about sex, love, and marriage. We've got to consummate that love. And really, it's hard to point to one passage in this song, because all over the place, these two are making love. They're like rabbits, okay? But there is one passage that I want to draw special attention to, because it has a lot of significance for a lot of us in this room, okay? So let's look at chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 1. She says, If only you were to me like a brother who was nursed at my mother's breast, then if I found you outside, I would kiss you, and no one would despise me. I would lead you and bring you to my mother's house. She who has taught me, I, I would give you spiced wine to drink, the nectar of my pomegranates. We're just going to stop reading there. A couple of points of clarity, okay? The first is this. She doesn't really wish that her husband was her brother. I know it says that, but that'd be really weird. What she's saying, though, is I wish I could kiss you in public. You see, for, for a man and a wife in ancient Israel, to kiss in public was a huge social no-no. It was scandalous. You didn't do that. But if you were a, a father and, and your children or a mother and your children, you could kiss. If you were siblings, you could kiss one another as a sign of affection or greeting. That was fine. And so what she's saying is really just, I wish I could kiss you in public. I wish I could just put one on your lips and nobody would look down on us. Nobody would scorn us. There'd be no shame in it. I just love you and I don't want to have to wait. That's the first thing in this passage that we need to understand. Second point is this. When she says, I want to take you to my mother's house, she's not talking about a building. There's a real strong likelihood that that is a euphemism uh, for her genitals. And then when she talks about my pomegranates, she's not talking about produce, folks. We're not going to belabor the point. Suffice it to say, she wants to be with her man in the most intimate expression of marriage possible. So here's why I say that this is a passage that's significant for a lot of us in this room, okay? Not all of us are young. Some of us have more than a few decades and a lot of miles on this body. And somebody wise once told me, you know what? When you get older, sex and marriage change. Libido changes. Health changes. And sometimes sex takes a back seat. 
There was this story, I heard this one time, true story about a 90-year-old man, 90-some-odd-year-old. His wife had passed away a few years prior, and he had taken a lady friend. And this guy was having coffee with his buddy one morning, and his friend, just very concerned, asked, so are, are you two, you know? And this 90-year-old man said, well, what if we are? And this friend said, well, you've got to knock that off. There comes a point in time where the body, just it's not good for the body to be engaging in that. And without missing a beat, this 90-something-year-old man said, well, if it's her time to go, it's her time to go, you know? Yeah, this was an ambitious dude, all right? Not all of us are quite so rearing to go, okay? Some of us, there might be some health concerns. There might be some age concerns. There might be something that's holding us back from having that intimate physical connection of sex. That doesn't mean that affection should disappear, though. That's why I think verse 1 in this passage is so significant because in that passage, she's not saying, I want to rip your clothes off. and She's saying, I want to kiss you. I just want to kiss you in public. I just I want, to, I want to show you my love in some physical way without there being any shame, without anybody looking down on us. I want to kiss you. Just because sex may take a sideline doesn't mean that affection should. There's a physical component to intimacy that is necessary if we want to keep that love and feeling alive. For some of us, though, the problem isn't age or health. For some of us, the problem is time or energy, or priority. These are real challenges that we face because life is busy, and it's not going to get less busy. And so we have to meet these challenges and overcome them because God has given us this incredible gift called sexual expression. It's something that's so special and so unique, and it differentiates our marriages from any other relationship in our lives. You just thought experiment here, okay? Think to the last time that you were with your spouse. You probably spoke to each other and listened to each other and connected with each other in a way that was totally different from the way that you speak or listen or connect with your coworkers, or your friends, or your family. It's something so vulnerable and so intimate. You're not going to go to work tomorrow morning and stand around the coffee pot and have the same kind of vulnerability and conversation with your coworkers as you did your spouse, it's just not going to happen. And if it did, you work in a weird place. I'm sorry. You're not going to invite your friends over for a game of cards and, and have that same kind of vulnerability and connection and listen to them say those kinds of things. Again, you got a weird card game if that's the kind of stuff you're talking about. Sex is something that differentiates our marriage from any other relationship in our lives. It's one of the very special reasons that God has given it to us. In fact, here's a little advertisement. Next week, we're going to talk more about sex and what actually it is and why it's so significant. In church, we do a really good job of talking about the rules and the guardrails around sex and, and protecting it. We don't always do a great job of talking about why it needs protecting. So that's what next week is for, just a little teaser for you. But here in this passage, in this context, what we see is that, that sex is this, this gift, this instrument that can serve as this glue in our relationship. And, and it would be a shame to have such a powerful instrument at our disposal and, and not make use of it. So if we want to keep that love and feeling alive, consummate that love. Marriage is hard. All right? there's, there's no two ways about it. There are good seasons. There are trying seasons. It's, just, it's tough. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that if you just follow three simple rules, you'll have a perfect marriage with no problems because that's a lie. You're still going to struggle. You're going to have some hard parts. But here's what I am telling you, okay? God has given us a picture, a model, of what marriage can be. It can be this kind of blessing. It can be this kind of intimacy. It can be this kind of joy. He's given this picture to us. It would be foolish not to try to learn from it. If you want to be successful in life, then you're going to watch successful people, and you're going to do what they do. If you want to be healthy in life, then you're going to look to healthy people and you're going to do what those healthy people do. God has given us this picture of this marriage that is strong, that is protected, and that after time still has that loving feeling. And if that's what you want, then we have to look at that and do what they do. And what we see them doing are at least these three things, talking about their love, vocalizing their affections making time for one another, not finding time because you're never going to find some unoccupied hour in your schedule like, oh, I didn't even know this was here. You got to make the time. And then last, we see them coming together to consummate that love and that physical act, that display that God created 
for that special relationship. And if we can put those three things into practice, we have a much stronger likelihood of keeping that love and feeling strong. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the people in this room, and I thank you for the wisdom that you've given us in your word. And I, want, I just right now want to lift up the marriages in this room um, because the enemy would love nothing more than to tear that union apart. And we've seen in our culture and in our country what happens when family and marriage deteriorate and are belittled. And so I pray for a hedge of protection around these marriages. I pray for strength for this husband and this wife. I pray that these pearls of wisdom from your word would make a difference, that as we seek to, to walk according to your instructions, that you would reward and bless these marriages with a richness and a vibrancy and a passion and a joy that you hope and wish for all of us. Father, that's my prayer for us. And we know that we can come to you and trust that you have the best intentions for us because you've withheld nothing from us. You gave us even your own son. And if you've laid his life down that we might be forgiven, we know that you have nothing but good intent for us. And so, Father, we praise you and we honor you with the hope and the promise that we have in Jesus and the wisdom that we have in your word. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen.